Thank you everyone for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just, this is my screen. So, uh, and when we talk about like scapulothoracic dissociation, it's a very uncommon and specific entity, which means it is scapula is unstable. So uh, I think it's very important to try to understand the scapula, which is, in my opinion, is still poorly understood worldwide. And I will try as much as possible to show you some of the things we have been trying to do to understand the scapula better. And this way we'll be able to understand all type of dissociation, instability, and everything else. So uh, <clears throat> a very important, and this is something I always teach the resident fellows, whenever we're talking about the shoulder, for some reason, there's always separation between the shoulder and the scapula, which in my opinion, never made sense because the scapula is the shoulder. The scapula is the shoulder. Glenoid is part of the scapula, it's one entity. And the shoulder is the whole region that is that in, in uh, uh, has three joints, one articulation. It's the glenohumeral is only one thing, <clears throat> but you have the AC joint, SC joint, and the scapulothoracic articulation. And uh, this is an anatomic dissection. I performed it uh, a few months ago while I was at the Mayo Clinic. And this is from one of my, I'm showing the resident fellows how unstable the scapula is without the joints and the muscles attached to it. So if you separate the uh, AC joint and the CC interval as well, and we try just to attach the muscle to what's gonna happen, the scapula is gonna fall. There's nothing that's gonna hold it. But at the same time, also, I, I always ask this question, why the scapula is sitting on the chest wall, on the posterior chest wall? Why is it up? Why is it not down? Why is it not now and the, and the axillary line? Why is it not on the anterior chest? And I, it is very important uh, sometime from the anatomic perspective and, and biomechanics uh, when we ask this question, because we assume the anatomy and we try to study it, but sometimes it is somehow good to try to go into the philosophy of it. Because right now, if I ask anyone of you, why the scapula is not on the tear chest? Because the way the chest it is, the scapula is sitting on the posterior chest and the muscles attached to it to give you the best mobility possible. And any other scenario will not give you the same, the same uh, kind of motion. And this is, I think, one of the amazing thing about the scapula and the shoulder. Now, again, scapula for me is the shoulder. They're not separated, but when we're talking about the scapula and what moving the scapula is one entity, there are six muscles that work around the scapula and eight that work specifically on the glenohumeral articulation, but they're all of them working on the shoulder. The two most important muscles, and these are the muscles like we talk about, and, and very often whenever you have a scapula pathology, we used to say this kinesia, or winging, and winging could be from trapezius paralysis, serratus paralysis. And I assure you, this uh, there, are, there are a lot of more things than just putting everything with the scapula pathology under uh, this kinesia, winging, and two muscle paralysis. There are much, much more than that. But what, what hold the scapula on the chest wall this dynamically are these two muscles. But again, whenever I'm talking about muscle dynamic stabilization, we're still talking about the shoulder as one entity, scapulothoracic, AC joint, SC joint, and then you have the shoulder, the shoulder which is the glenohumeral joint itself. But the two biggest muscles dynamically affecting the function of the scapula are the serratus and the trapezius. Now this is a nice animation. I was planning to do something like this, but I found this animation from uh, University of Lyon, which I thought it was very nice because most of us as shoulder surgeon, we don't see this. We see only the exam from outside and we operate on the shoulder itself. While this one anatomically, we don't see it as much. Where the serratus is originating from the first to the ninth rib, how it attaches on the undersurface of the scapula and affect the protraction, which is moving the scapula on the chest wall anterior, as well as the distal tip of the scapula has to move in order to open the subacromial space for the shoulder to function well. So this protraction action in the horizontal plane, not the vertical plane, horizontal plane is all serratus. This protraction here is serratus. So you can imagine someone's trying to do push up. serratus is not working. The glenohumeral joint and the deltoid rotator cuff could be perfect, but you cannot do it. Why? Because this construct need to be stable to function. 
And uh, this is again, again, showing how the serratus anterior hold the scapula on the chest wall and protract it anteriorly as well. So anytime you try to raise your arm up, if the scapula is not stable on the chest wall, it's gonna wing off the chest wall and cause all kinds of derangement. And the serratus is a very important muscle to hold the scapula on the chest wall. Now, that's the serratus anterior. So the most important part of the serratus anterior is the distal part. Why? Because the distal part is the one that holds the tip of the scapula and protects it forward. The middle and proximal are not as important. They're thin, they're not as important. This is the most important part. So here we're detaching the distal the, the scapula and we're gonna place a suture on it. And we'll show you biomechanically how this altered the function of the quote unquote, the shoulder. So when the serratus is attached and you're trying to flex the shoulder, this is subacromial space. You can see how the serratus keep this uh, scapula tip on the chest wall and protract it anterior. Now, if the serratus is detached, what happened? The scapula tilt, it, the whole scapula wing and tilt forward. And with this, way, with this tilting forward, the subacromial space will narrow and you cannot flex your shoulder. So you lose the stability of the scapula when the serratus is not working. And this can affect significantly the function of the shoulder. And of course, the second muscle that can contribute, this is combined position of the scapula to allow the shoulder to function well is a trapezius. Now, Trapezius, and this is, uh, I, um, I always try to talk about these two muscles a lot because as a resident long time ago and a fellow, it always confused me like the really the difference and talking about different kinds of winking and which I really I changed the terminology so that it will not be confusing. I can tell you the only muscle that originate from the neck and attach on the lateral aspect of the scapula, which means on the acromion is a trapezius. There is no other muscle that does this, which means for the scapula, quote unquote, the shoulder, for the scapula to remain in its level position, the only muscle that will keep it in its level position, the trapezius. Because if trapezius is not working, the scapula is gonna drop down, which means drooping and tilt forward, okay? So this is a three part of the trapezius, upper, middle, and lower. So if we detach the trapezius, and notice here, the trapezius is a huge muscle and attached on the clavicle, more anterior, on the acromion, more lateral, spine, more posterior. So when the trapezius function, if it doesn't function, what happens, the scapula wants to droop. In most books, they tell you it's drooping. It's not only drooping. It is scapula go distal and tilt forward because the clavicle attachment of, of the trapezius is not there anymore. So it will droop down and tilt forward, okay? So if you look here, notice what's happening. The trapeze is holding it, it's, it's working very nicely and it's going into a level horizontal position. If not, it droops down and tilt forward. When you take the trapezius out, you can see what happened. It's not only drooping, it's droop in an anterior tilt. And this will cause prominence of the scapula, they call it winging, which is, we're gonna talk about it in a second. And this is what the trapezius does. So the serratus hold the tip of the scapula, distal tip of the scapula on the chest wall and protracted. The trapezius hold the scapula erect in a horizontal position and allow the scapula to be in more horizontal and retracted position as well. And there are three muscles deep to the trapezius, levator, scapular, rhomboid minor, rhomboid major. These essentially help to medialize or bring the scapula close to the spine. They're not as essential, but become more essential if the muscles get paralyzed, the trapezius get paralyzed. So if you notice now, this is the distal tip of the scapula. It protracts with the serratus. It retracts and go to the spine with the, with the rhomboid major. Pectoralis minor is a muscle that is really very uh, uncommonly talked about. However, I did realize over time from different patients, different pathology, it's one of those mus muscles that are very annoying. Why? Because it, it is very small, very hidden, but can cause a lot of trouble. So I do call it the appendix of the shoulder. So when you have appendicitis, you get the appendix out and there is no dysfunction and you become healthy. When the, the, the pectoralis minor is hyperactive and pathologic, it become very annoying, very disturbing, and you can they release it and you'll get, you'll get better. So the key with all of this is just, just to kind of give perspective how important it is for all this musculature around the scapula to hold it, stabilize it, 
because this association is destabilized to stabilize it and allow it to move well on the chest wall. And most importantly, not the minute you see someone has quote unquote winging, you say, oh my God, there's something pathologic. Because if I showed you this guy, you cannot tell me this guy has serratus paralysis or trapezius paralysis. This patient is happy, as you notice, he's laughing, he's smiling. All what he's doing, he's hyperactivating the pectoralis minor, which allow, you, allow him to overtill the scapula anterior, and he's relaxing his serratus anterior. So when you do this, it will link the scapula of the chest wall. And this is, again, again, one of those things that you have to have a very good knowledge of the anatomy, mechanics, and the exam of the shoulder uh, of the scapula to be able to, to determine what's the pathology and what you can do. This is what I spoke about it before. Like uh, this is done, this is not done by me. This is by Lat J, Ed Smoller, and Yost. And what I like about it is you see uh, this amazing athlete. If you look, you think everything is doing with his shoulder, his deltoid and everything are normal. But I assure you, if this upper trapeze is not working, if the serratus is not working, the scapula will be unstable. There is no way for him to be able to hold his weight with his arm. We, we tend to think always about the, the glenohumeral joint. I know it is the most important. However, remember the glenohumeral joint or the glenoid is the scapula. So whenever something affecting the stability of the scapula, it will affect uh, also, uh, it will affect the function of the shoulder. So for now, I know most of you who uh, see patient with a scapula problem, they say, oh, this patient has winging and in your mind, he has either serratus or trapezius paralysis or has dyskinesia because he has some shoulder pain and they call it dyskinesia, even though there's no true definition. And whenever you talk about winging, they call to also talk about medial and lateral, which in my opinion, very confusing. I have been trying for the past few years, specifically the past year or two, to change the terminology because it's confusing. The terminology is supposed to be descriptive, not to be an indicator for, for someone who needs surgery or not. So instead of, of saying winging and dyskinesia and get confused which one needs surgery or not, you can put everything abnormal around the scapula under one term. I call it a STAN, scapulothoracic abnormal motion. So whenever you have someone who has an abnormal scapulothoracic motion, don't think about it, oh, this is winging, this is trapezius, no, no. Just think about it as an abnormal motion and try to figure out what's the pathology and based on the pathology, you'll decide what will be the type of treatment. So etiology, what are things that will cause a STEM, scapulothoracic abnormal motion? And we'll start from very simple to very complex. So very simple, and you're gonna see there are a lot of entities that are not in the, the, our medical dictionary of what is the scapulothoracic quote unquote winging because for us, it is this kinesia, it means shoulder pain, and winging it means either serratus paralysis or trapezius paralysis. It is not correct. So you can have a stem, abnormal motion, if you have bursitis, scapulothoracic bursitis. It means the bursa between the scapula and the chest wall will be abnormal, and then the scapula, it will be inflamed, and the motion between scapula and the chest wall become abnormal. Muscle detachment. This is an articulation. Even though it's not joint, but it's an articulation, it's very... Mo mobile articulation had muscle attachments. So this muscle, like any muscle in the body can get detached, can get tear, it can cause pain, can cause a stam, this is scapulothoracic abnormal motion. Abnormal function or muscle, abnormal muscle function or abnormal dysfunctional muscle. And this is very, very important. Like uh, this, uh, and I will show you some examples for this patient. She was sent to me for muscle transfer because like you can see, quote unquote, she's winging and they told me, yeah, this is her serratus is whatever, paralyzed. And if you uh, learn how to examine the scapula very well, you will know that her trapezius and serratus are working, but the way she's activating them are not normal. And she's also exhibiting pectoral spinal hyperactivity. So when I pull her back to where the scapula is supposed to be, her function goes back to normal. But this is this, the, the same test you do for someone who has also serratus paralysis. So not everyone who has quote unquote winging, it means he has serratus paralysis. The winging term is a STEM, is scapulothoracic abnormal motion that can indicate a lot of pathologies and you should know how to do exam very well to determine which pathology it is to address it. So now, right now I give you three, three different etiologies. Number four is the muscle paralysis. I did not even put it number one. 
Like this patient had thoracotomy before. He did have a true, uh, he has a stem, but from a true trapezius paralysis. For me, trapezius paralysis, they don't cause uh, much winging, quote unquote winging. They cause a stem, but it's mostly what I told you with the anatomy about. You can see drooping and the scapula is, is tilted forward. And this is very typical of trapezius paralysis. Now, any abnormality in the glenohumeral joint, AC joint and SC joint can cause a stem. Like look at this patient, you can look at her scapula really, really tilting forward. And this is a case I presented, in fact, at the academy two years ago in front of three well-known world authorities in the shoulder, and everyone had a different opinion. So this patient, if you examine carefully, the muscle around the scapula, they're normal, but she's an obstetric brachial plexus injury and her shoulder is dislocated. This is her 3D printing. This is exactly her chest. And notice at rest, her shoulder in abduction contracture. Why? Because the shoulder is posterior subluxated and locked and she's an abduction contracture. So anytime she tried to press her hand to put it in normal AD adduction, the scapular wing of the chest wall. And this is again, again, to go back to our point that we talk about the anatomy originally, that the shoulder is glenohumeral, AC joint, SC joint, scapulothoracic articulation. Any of these can affect the functionality of the shoulder. And we get to more complex cases. If you have the scapula partly uh, uh, out, like resected from tumor, from trauma, from fractures, and you lose bone, or occasionally if the rib support, because remember the scapula is like this boat sailing on the chest. If the chest is abnormal, scapula will become abnormal. If someone has no ribs, the scapula, what will happen to it, it will sit inside the chest. So any abnormality in the bone can affect that, uh, also cause a stem or a significant scapulothoracic abnormal motion. If we go into some of the detail, and this is, I'm gonna focus mostly how to examine the serratus and the uh, trapezius. Uh, I, uh, I really, uh, whenever I look into a stem to make sure it is related to serratus um, uh, paralysis or muscle paralysis, you, you notice patient at rest, he's at rest here. Look, this is him at rest, not at rest, it means he's not moving. In general, except if it's trapezius paralysis, because remember the trapezius hold the scapula up on the chest, so it's paralyzed at rest is gonna, is gonna droop and tilt forward. But the serratus, remember it stabilized the tip of the scapula, distal tip on the chest wall and protracted when during motion. So usually if you're not moving, the tip is normal, kind of normal, maybe slightly prominent, but become much more abnormal during motion. So if you have someone who start with the scapula really majorly tilt, you cannot jump into the diagnosis immediately of serratus paralysis. So how can we diagnose a serratus paralysis? Uh, in general, how can we do it? I rely on three or four different tests and the push-up test is the least on my list. In fact, the last on my list, even though this is what's written in the books and even ask about an exam. Because if someone has some kind of muscle weakness or shoulder weakness or paralysis, they cannot do the push-up test and the patient can fool you with the push-up test. So the three tests or four tests will do, including the push-up, number one is flexion against resistance. So when the elbow is fully extended, you ask the patient to flex against resistance. You need the stability of the scapula for the patient to resist. You can have the, the, the most normal deltoid rotator cuff and we try to resist and the scapula is unstable, you're not gonna be able to resist. You're gonna feel weak on exam. So whenever you try to resist and the scapula wing of the chest, it means it's unstable because of the serratus. And this is a really very good test. And usually I examine it in 30 and around 80 degrees of flexion. This is test number one. Test number two is protraction against resistance. Remember I showed you the animation from University of Lyon, how you protract the scapula on the chest wall during push-ups or doing anything else. This scapula moving fully on the chest in that plane, protraction plane, is mainly, mainly the serratus anterior. So if you try to block the shoulder from protraction, the only thing that will push against your hand is the serratus anterior. So if the patient cannot resist you, look, I'm trying, look what's happening. He cannot push it forward because the tip of the scapula is unstable, the serratus is not working. In a normal shoulder, it moves very nicely. In the serratus weakness or serratus paralysis, it's not gonna move. 
So flexion against resistance, protraction against resistance. In a normal shoulder, it is stable. In abnormal shoulder, it is not when the serratus is paralyzed. The third, as you notice, I said here, less favorable for me. I really do it only for teaching purpose because they talk about it because I don't rely on it as much. Uh, and the fourth test that it's not true really test is mostly is an implication for surgery. Remember the scapula is what keep this, the, the, the serratus what keep the scapula on the chest wall. So if it's not stable, the patient cannot flex. This patient had a thoracotomy, the long thoracic was gone, serratus was weak. You can see you stabilize the scapula, his deltoid and rotator cuff give you the function you want. If he's not, it's unstable, he cannot even flex. And you can see the scapula have a major stand. So now I, I try to mimic the function of the serratus by compression, compressing the scapula on the chest wall and boom, he will be able to flex. And this is what you need to think if you wanna do surgery because the surgery will be something to mimic this kind of function, which is serratus function. And this is what we're gonna get to, to it next. So what can we do to reconstruct the serratus function if it's paralyzed and the scapula unstable or dissociated? And it is to try to reconstruct the, the most important part of the serratus, which is the distal serratus. And in this case, you have to get the muscle that has similar line of pull, tension, excursion as a serratus. And the best one, which I'll call it the brother of the serratus is the pectoralis major. Because if you look at the fibers of the serratus originating from one to nine or 10 on the chest and attached on the scapula, the pectoralis is the same. Start from the clavicle and going from the sternum, but it's around the same ribs almost all the way down. The difference though, pectoralis insert on the humerus while there's a serratus insert on the scapula. So if we take the sternal head, you don't have to take both and just take the sternal insertion and put it on the scapula to become like a serratus. And this is usually uh, what we do with this type of surgery. Usually we don't have to do big incision and almost always this is a, something I modified. I don't use tendon graft. I just take the uh, sternal head of the pectoralis with a piece of bone. And usually when you untwist it, you get gain around a half an inch of length. And then you expose the tip of the scapula because remember again, this is the most important part to be stabilized and help the scapula in protraction. I put a bunch of suture, at least five double sutures. Sometimes even I use endo button. And the aim is to get the sternal head from its insertion on the humerus to the insertion to insert it on uh, the, uh, the scapula. So now we can see this is a pectoralis tendon and bone next to the scapula and you can put the suture and attach, you do bone to bone attachment of the uh, sternal head of pectoralis major to the distal tip of the scapula. Now it does stabilize the distal tip of the scapula and mimic the serratus function. The advantage of this technique is if you have a bone healing, you have a very good stability of the shoulder and you have very nice recovery as well. And sometimes if you use endobutton, you can even do just simple x-rays. You see the endobutton in place, you see the bone in place, you know the patient is healing and you can progress quickly. For the right indication, you can have fantastic function and fantastic outcome because you are essentially restoring the function of the muscle that's lost. And you can see in her case, you have a small incision, her function is restored fully. And we've done more than 200 of these. For the right patient, you can have fantastic outcome. For the trapezius paralysis, again, again, remember, many times you know it by observation. If you can expose the back of the patient, you can see the difference. This is level, this is drooped. This is anterior tilt, this is not. You know this is number one sign. So gross inspection of trapezius paralysis will show you drooping of the shoulder, rattle translation of the scapula and this anterior tilt. Very, very common. And you can see in general, they have no, remember the attachment from the neck to here is gone. So when you try to, they try to shrug their shoulder, they're shrugging with their neck and they're trying to use the levator scapula, which is not efficient and effective. This is very strong muscle band. And you can see, look, he's pulling on his neck. He's not able to shrug the shoulder up. Why? Because notice the difference. This is the muscle here is going from the neck to the lacrimal acromion. He do it, does it very well. Here there's none. He's twisting his cap, he's twisting his, his whole body and his neck because that attachment, that muscle powerful attachment between the neck and the lateral acromion is absent. Now, in general, in the especially early cases, they lose some flexion, not as much. Remember why? Because the serratus is still functional. And when the serratus function is still helped with the protraction, 
and can still relatively open the subacromial space even though it's not full. Like this patient, she's struggling, but in a way she'll be able to get her flexion, but abduction almost always a lost. Now, very important, and this is something I've seen it before in different meetings. In this patient, you don't do scapula compression test or scapula stabilization test. Why? Remember I said, we don't have much quote unquote winging. You have some stem, but not major winging. The major winging you see it in serratus paralysis because the scapular stability and holding of the scapula on the chest is lost because this is the most important function of the serratus. The trapezius, you have this droop down. So if you try to compress the scapula, it is not doing the function of the trapezius. What's the function of the trapezius? Remember, is to, to hold the whole acromium and the shoulder up and slightly retract it backward. So instead of compressing, you try to reposition the scapula. So in someone with trapezius paralysis, you try to retract down at back and pull it in a horizontal position or in the more erect position. And in this case, the patient will be able to move. A simple compression will not do it because you're not mimicking the function of the trapezius. Okay, so you try to uh, rechange the anterior tilt and reposition of the scapula. This is the same. Patient had this one, had this problem because for, I think she has breast uh, resection, radiotherapy, or oh, sorry, neck resection. And, and uh, uh, also she had radiation therapy and she could not flex. And her shoulder is again drooped and protracted forward. We don't compress, we try to reposition. So I'm gonna try with my arm to retract it back or change the tilt and move it up and ask the patient to abduct her shoulder and boom, she will abduct because you mimic the function of the trapezius. And that patient at that time she cried because for eight years she never was able to move her arm up. All what I did function, uh, it, with my exam is to mimic the function of the lost function of the lost muscle. This way you confirm the diagnosis, number one. Number two, this is very important implication for treatment because you know if you can do any type of muscle transfer or reconstruction that can reposition the scapula the way my hand did, the patient will do well after surgery. And this we come here to uh, what has been described and what we changed. So what has been described for this trapezius paralysis is the Eden Lang procedure. I think the idea of the Eden Lang was, well, we have this muscle from the back. If we lateralize them, they should mimic the function of the trapezius. That is not correct. Because if you notice here, I, I mentioned before that the rhomboid major usually pull the tip of the scapula toward the spine. The trapezius with the serratus, in order to abduct the shoulder, the tip of the scapula have to move away from the spine. If you take the rhomboid, which usually medialize the tip of the scapula, and you put it more laterally, it's gonna cause worsening of this medialization. This is number one. Number two, remember the trapezius, I mentioned it earlier, anatomically, it's insertion on the clavicle, acromion, and spine. Does not attach to the body of the scapula. So if we really wanna mimic the function of the trapezius, we should insert all the three on the spine of the scapula. And this is a procedure we modified and we published about. We call it the triple transfer or T3. And we take levator scapulae more lateral near the acromion, rhomboid minor next to it, and rhomboid major also next to it. And the rhomboid major, we're gonna see it now, we're gonna fish mouth it, which means we have to split it in half and we have to kind of almost uh, drape it around the medial spine of the scapula. Biomechanically, that's how the normal shoulder scapula move. That is with the Eden Lang and that's with the triple transfer and this is a, a biomechanical study done by J.D. Werthel, uh, his friend of mine when he was back at Mayo. So, and, and here I'm just, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but I will show you, this is the levator scapula with piece of bone, and this is rhomboid minor, and this is rhomboid major, one, two, and three. And instead of taking these two and put them on the body of the scapula, we're gonna prepare the spine and the acromium and place everything on them. So this is a acromion, this is spine of the scapula after the breathing, and we put a lot of sutures. You need to put a lot of suture because the three muscles are gonna be lifting the whole weight of the arm. Notice the fish mouthing of the rhomboid major because it's broad. So we put a part of this, uh, the bone on top of the spine, middle spine, and one underneath the spine. And this is here, the rhomboid minor being attached, and this is a rhomboid major. Again, we split it and we fish mouth it. Middle spine of the scapula here, one piece will be under, under the medial spine, one on top of the medial spine. So we call it the fish mouth because it's almost essentially closing the mouse on the medial spine of the scapula 
and we suture it this way. Now, if you look at this, this looks like a trapezius. Instead of taking these two muscles and put them down all the way down in the body of the scapula. And this is, we call it the triple muscle transfer. The patient will usually immobilize for eight weeks in abduction after surgery. And we have, we have a lot of these patients. This is a 41 patient. At least we have a long, relatively good follow-up. I will not say long follow-up. We have really excellent uh, outcome from this type of surgery in terms of function and improvement of pain. This is an example of this kid who I showed you earlier that he really did not have any flexion or abduction before surgery. And this is him after the triple muscle transfer. One year only after triple muscle transfer, and now he's able to flex and abduct the shoulder fully. And usually they keep on improving at least up to two years or three years. Now we'll go from here to the atypical. So remember what I told you early on, when the patient at rest, the scapula tip is, is kind of like all the way up. You have to question what's going on. Because normally the serratus, even if it's paralyzed, usually the scapula still will sit on the chest wall until you move. And this patient was sent to me for muscle transfer. But when I examined her, and her trapezius looks okay. And then independently examined the serratus the way I showed you before, flexion against resistance, protraction against resistance, they were normal. So what she had is, uh, was, was a pectoral spinal hyperactivity and she learned how to hypoactivate the serratus. Now, some of these patients, they already have heard they have serratus paralysis. When you tell them this, tell them the EMG is not correct, your exam is so and so, they're not convinced. So what I usually tell them, I tell them, okay, I will explore the serratus, the distal tip. If it's abnormal, I will do muscle transfer. If not, I will try to do something else. I, call, I will show right now, I will do scapula pexy. Scapula pexy essentially tying the scapula with a tendon allograph to the chest. This will stretch over time. So the whole job of this pexy is just to hold the scapula enough on the chest wall for the patient to be able to reactivate the muscle correctly. This is another example for a patient who, in my opinion, is not, uh, is not a normal exam because notice here, he's winging out, he has a stem. Also, he was told he has serratus paralysis. But notice, I showed you a patient before, when you stabilize the scapula, the patient is smiling, happy. They're able to move everywhere. When you try to stabilize, and you look at his face and you see the patient is resisting you. Almost he does not want the stability. This is a big red flag. It means there's an abnormal muscle activation, not necessarily because of weakness. In general, patients who have trapezius paralysis, you do repositioning of the scapula or serratus paralysis, you do the compression test. They love it. They tell you, if you can keep your hand, it will be great. It feels great. When someone is resisting you, he does not want it. It means there's something wrong, which means muscle abnormal muscle activation and pectoral spinal hyperactivity. And in this patient, this is the best way to uh, confirm. Usually I explore the serratus only for the sake of patient because on exam, I know it was correct, it was good. And notice here, this is latissimus is down. This is serratus anterior, looks normal. You activate it, look, it's perfect contraction. And this is here, I'm using the checkpoint for that. And the patient has a normal serratus anterior. So usually I take a video and I show it to the patient so that they will know that their serratus is normal. It's not only based on an opinion, but confirmed by fact. And you can see how nicely the serratus here is functional. So with the pectoral spinal hyper hyperactivity, it's always like this anterior protraction of the scapula that you need to correct. And so what we usually do in this patient with an abnormal muscle motion and pectoral hyper hyperactivity is we do pectoral spinal release, and this is done arthroscopic and this is for those, for those of you who've done arthroscopic lethargy, it's very similar, but this one only pectoral spinal, honestly, it's very quick surgery. It should not take more than 10 minutes because you go five, 10 minutes because you go in, you go medial to the coracoid and just release the pectoral spinal and that's it. And it's pretty quick surgery. And this will decrease this anterior pull, pull on the coracoid uh, of the patient and this does on the scapula. And uh, we also add, oh, the video is not working. We also add scapula pexy, as I told you, we add the tendon allograft attachment between the distal tip of the scapula and the rib at that level. And this patient that was, that was sent to me for muscle transfer, I did for her this combination, pectoral spinal release, scapula pexy, you can see small incision. Look at her function. She's perfectly okay and everything is functioning very well. Why? Because her musculature were normal, except for the pectoral spinal hyperactivity and the way they work together, the muscles working around the scapula together was abnormal. So I tried to uh, 
stabilize the scapular time enough for the patient to regain the appropriate muscle activation around the scapula. And this is another patient. You can see the small incision here, the SAM. Same, she had the STAM and she had this um, uh, pectoral spinal hyperactivity and ab abnormal muscle activation. And you can do the pectoral spinal release and scapula pexy, and usually they do very well. Now we we'll go to more complex problem. Like this is almost like a true scapular thoracic dissociation and torn muscle, but this patient, he came to me and essentially he has uh, absent trapezius and his serratus also is dysfunctional. And these patients, they need the scapula to be stable on the chest wall. And whenever we don't have muscles around the scapula, we perform the scapulothoracic fusion. The, the, the scapulothoracic fusion stabilizes the scapula on the chest wall to allow the shoulder to function very well when you don't have any muscles. And we do it uh, with a circlage wire. Now we do true sutures for, for the uh, fusion. And we pass around the ribs and we stabilize it with a plate uh, uh, on the scapula. And usually the scapula, we position, we position the scapula on the chest wall while the arm is in a flex position. This way you can give you the best position of the scapula on the chest wall while it is healing. And this patient, five months post-op, and uh, I haven't seen him since, but I'm giving you an example how good they do uh, even early, consider relatively early post-op for someone essentially has no function to someone has a really very good function. And for those who really they've done for the right indication, some of you think, oh, well, but how much motion they're gonna get? Look at this motion. This patient is an ascus a couple of thrust fusion, look at this flexion. You position the scapula correctly on the chest and if you use it, you can get very, very, very good function. Flexion and abduction. Some limitation, minimal. Now, what if the patient, for example, have bad scapulothoracic muscles and the muscle around the scapula are bad bilaterally but uh, the patient is not a good candidate for scapulothoracic fusion. Like this patient has lung disease. And uh, uh, if we do the scapulothoracic fusion, sometimes it affects minimally the ventilation of the lung because like you restrict five ribs. So if someone has a true bad lung disease, you cannot do it. So this is a procedure we came up with, which is we call the scapula tethering, which is connecting the right to the left scapula. So we use the Achilles tendon allograft and we connect the medial spine of the scapula on the right to the medial scapula on the left. All what it does is essentially you can see early on in skinny patient, you can see it very well in less skinny patient, it's not as apparent, but it stabilizes the scapula in good position without, need, without the needing to do a fusion. This patient has a facial scapular humeral dystrophy and he did not want fusion. He is a medical student. He wants to go back to his medical school. And he said, I don't want a fusion. If you can give me some function, I'm okay with it. So we did for him right to left scapula pexy, and he really did relatively very, very well. Uh, another very good indication for this procedure, if someone is very young, like this kid also had muscle, deficient muscle around the scapula bilaterally, and he's a kid. In this age, you cannot even do fusion because most of the scapula is cartilage. You cannot fuse cartilage on the ribs, and the ribs is, will be all, all, a big part of the cartilage. So this will be another indication for right to left scapula pexy because this uh, scapula tethering, I mean, sorry, scapula tethering, because this will stabilize the scapula enough. And if he's grown up, uh, when he's grown and is still bothering him, we can perform fusion when he's older. Uh, this is a patient I showed you earlier uh, with a lung disease and I did for him the right to left uh, scapula tethering. And uh, like in the United States, a lot of people like to golf and he just wants to send me video from, I think he's in Florida right now or Arizona. And just to show me like he's went back to his golfing and this is all what he wanted to do. We'll go even to more complex problem. Like when you start to have more and more deficiency, like to show you again, as long as you know the principle and you can try in a way uh, to follow this principle of how to stabilize the scapula for different scenarios, you can still get to good function. This patient, for example, 14 years old, she had that abnormal scapular position and the, the person who saw her does not ex, did not examine the scapula very well. He called it, quote unquote, winging. And in winging in general, they asked the patient to wait for a year. And this patient was not improving. So they did the imaging for her. And what she had was chondrosarcoma. So this patient had the prominent of the scapula at rest. And remember, I told you, in general, the real prominent of scapula should not be at rest. It's mostly with action, with function, except Sometimes the tip could be prominent if you have trapezius paralysis, but when you see the whole scapula lift of the chest at rest, this is someone you have to question mark what's going on. You don't, you don't wanna miss something like this, which is extremely uncommon, but may happen. So a large chondrosarcoma. 
The problem though is like if you want to resect, you have to resect most of it over the scapula. And, and when you end up after resection with a big chondrosarcoma, it this. So you say, yeah, we can do still fusion. We can stabilize her. Well, yes, in a way, but remember the only piece you can fuse is this portion. And, and the weight of the arm is here. What's gonna happen? This part is gonna break. So you have to make sure to do something to be able to fuse, but with a stable construct. So in her case, we took the second and we attached to the third rib as a vascularized bone. And this acted as a post to stabilize the top of the scapula. And then we use a fibula allograph to reinforce this piece so that this one will not be weak or break as well. And you can see it here is done and you can see we were able to, to put it on three, four ribs. And then we added the plate as well to reinforce the whole construct. Now we have much stronger construct and the patient had only and only teres major because remember with the resection of the scapula, you're resecting the uh, uh, infraspinatus, infraspinatus, everything else. But because you still have the lateral border of the scapula, we still have the teres major but we use it for muscle transfer to give her shoulder rotation. So, and this is, she, her fusion was very good. This is her five months after surgery, which we felt it is pretty good for five months for something could potentially have been a disaster. And this is her one and a half year after surgery. And she's playing volleyball and she won in fact, the best uh, defense in her team playing volleyball. And, and you notice like during playing, you can barely know which shoulder it was operated on. So you follow principles, you make a good construct to try to restore as much as possible the shoulder and you can get good function. Now we go to a worse problem if you have chest deficiency, like some patients need to have rib resection because they have some kind of a lung cancer or different kind of cancer and they end up having, having a significant deficiency in the, in the area. So this patient, as I told you, remember the scapula is almost like a boat sailing on the chest. When the chest is deficient, the scapula will sink. And this patient had resection of the ribs on this area. So the there's no place for the scapula to sit. So it went inside the chest. And you can see here the scapula inside the chest. And the motion is, of course, very, very limited. Now we go back to my question early on in this presentation. I said, why the scapula is not on the anterior chest or in the axillary line? This is why, because when it is not in where it is posteriorly, the motion will be significantly limited. So for this patient, we have to try to pry it off from the inside the chest and put it on the ribs as much as possible on ribs to get as much stability as possible, put as a, a hardware and bony graph to get as much stabilization. And we try to get uh, as much function as possible. So this patient was pretty happy. There is no pain and his function was significantly improved. And I think this is what I have for this session. I hope it was helpful for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bessem, for this uh, very interesting and elegant talk. Thank you so much. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, we are waiting for questions from uh, our attendees. Uh, we have uh, about uh, more uh, than uh, 100 uh, attendees. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmad Sheikh will be the moderator of this session. Dr. Ahmad. Yes, hi, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks, Professor Hassan, for this uh, wonderful talk. It's a uh, it's very complex thing to to uh, to understand everything around the scapula. And uh, I really appreciate this wonderful talk because you put everything, especially the anatomic specimen in the, at the beginning, it was very, very uh, evident for how, how it works, especially when you cut the serratus, when you suture it, then this is the effect of uh, loss of the serratus and nerve to serratus anterior, for, for example. So I really appreciate, I hope all our colleagues have uh, spotted these uh, basic things which uh, facilitate the understanding of the whole problem. I got one question here from one of our colleagues. He's, he's asking about any uh, uh, scapular uh, um, surgeries for brachioplexus palsy patients. Is there any rule for uh, surgeries around scapula? In these well, uh, first of all, it depends which part, like we're talking about adult or, or obstetric. And in either case, uh, it's very interesting because this, this week I get a patient who sent to me from a colleague who's really very, very good shoulder surgeon. Uh, and he was recommending a fusion because he has an obstetric brachial plexus. His scapula was, was, had a bad stem. And uh, when I saw the patient, I told him, absolutely not. I'll tell you why. 
because again, again, if I know this talk is very complex because this is, has everything around the scapula and if someone is not used to the scapula, they say, oh, what, what, what is this coming from? But at least it will give the people perspective about the importance of the scapula. The most important, if anything, I can give the audience about this talk is how you perform a DQ2 exam to understand the philosophy and then you decide. Not you see winking, you say, yeah, let's do, let's do fusion. If you think, uh, if you look at the patient with brachial plexus, in general, especially obstetric, almost all of them, they have stem. Why? Because the scapula is smaller, they have abnormal bone, and they start, whenever they try to move, they compensate a lot with the scapula. So the scapula move off the chest and it looks like as if they're winging. And this is an example I showed in this presentation about patient with obstetric who has an abduction contracture because her shoulder was dislocated. And whenever the shoulder is locked in this location, it's almost like fusing a patient in around 60 to 80 degree of flexion and let, let them start to move. The only thing that move is the scapula, so the scapula becomes super prominent. Now in this patient, if you try to address the scapula, you're missing the reason of this abnormality, which is shoulder and the glenohumeral joint itself. So you lock them in place and this patient, their motion is if we say approximately the normal uh, the shoulder motion is two third one third this is very rough two third the glenohumeral one third scapulothoracic and obstetric plexus almost always the reverse is two thirds scapulothoracic one third glenohumeral you lock the scapulothoracic motion you lost your function and there's nothing else you can do so i i would say over the past 14 years i haven't done a single uh, uh, scapula fusion on any of obstetric or, or adult brachial plexus. The only situation I do something to stabilize the scapula, if they have nerve transfer, the scapula is droop, I can do something to help it. If someone is moving and they ha have documented serratus weakness in an adult, I will try to do something. Otherwise, it's extremely, extremely uncommon. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, another question about the acute traumatic scapulothoracic dissociation. Uh, yes. it's, uh, I know it's, it's not the focus of, of your talk, but uh, it's in, in similar. No, but, but this is why, because see, like we treat, we, we're talking about scapulothoracic dissociation. If we don't understand the basic, now you're try, trying to talk about something very complex and we're just trying to say, okay, what's the treatment? Well, you know, let's, let's understand first what we're talking about and then we'll talk because based on what we spoke about right now, what is a scapulothoracic dissociation? Scapulothoracic dissociation, quote unquote, it means the separation of the scapula from the chest wall from different reason. If you look into the trauma literature, they almost talk about the AC joint separation, CC joint separation is some kind of injury around the scapula. What we need to know is if the, 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 the bony structures are stable and the scapula is still abnormal, it means you have a muscle abnormality tear, this is what you need to address. And this is why I did not sit and talk about scapulothoracic dissociation. I tried to talk about principle. So if someone coming and you're moving after major trauma and you had scapula, they call it dissociation. What does dissociation mean? Is it the combination of AC, CC joint and a fracture? Is it a combination of this and muscle tear? For me, whenever you stabilize the bone and the scapula is moving well, it means the muscle are okay. I don't have to do anything for the muscular part. If, however, there's a true documented uh, dissociation, which means really the muscles, all the muscle around the scapula is to are torn, which I haven't seen, by the way, extremely uncommon, extremely uncommon, then you can address it if you don't have other bony abnormalities. So if you have bony fracture, AC joint, you can address them and take a look. And based on the exam I mentioned, you can decide what you can do for any of these muscles to, to stabilize them. In the worst case scenario, if you have a very bad situation, comminuted uh, clavicle, AC joint separation, true muscle, de muscle injury, then you can do scapulothoracic fusion if you don't have anything else to do. Thanks so much, thank you. Um, so uh, I didn't think you have any further question, but uh, just to, to, uh, to conclude, if, uh, in terms of frequency from the causes of the STEM, uh, what, what are the most common causes of uh, um, STEM or scapular? Uh, very, very excellent question. So any abnormality in the AC shoulder joint will cause STEM. Uh, so I'll tell you, for example, Ahmed, like uh, if you have patient who coming to you with rotator cuff tear, 
no offense, I, pr I promise you, you will not examine the scapula. You'll examine the shoulder. I examine the scapula all the time. Even the resident and fellows, I'll tell them, if a woman, I'll tell her to be decent just to be able to see her scapula. If a man, I always undress them. I tell the patient, I tell my resident, I know it will be normal probably, but don't miss an abnormal scapula. Make it a habit you'll be able to see one after one after one, then you start to get your own perspective of how the scapula move on the chest wall. So I can tell you it's a really, especially mild stamp is extremely common in any kind of shoulder pathology. You're gonna see some abnormality, but we're gonna talk about something that will really, really uh, is major. Unfortunately, is not serratus paralysis or trapezius paralysis. It is, yes. This is the problem I'm trying to change in the United States and worldwide because this is what's in books, in exams. If you're sitting for any, any, any examination, this is what they talk about. Unfortunately, this is not it. I have a very large scapular practice and believe it or not, a majority of them is the pectoralis minor hyperactivity and then abnormal scapular thoracic function, which if over the years we start to learn better how to do this exam, then there's a very good chance we don't have to do a lot of unnecessary muscle transfer. So I will say for my practice, this is number one. And then you have the serratus paralysis is number two and trapezius paralysis is number three. But I almost like I had started a mass general at Harvard. I started at Harvard only six weeks ago. Every, almost every single same day surgery, I have at least one pectoral spinal hyperactivity and abnormal scapular thoracic motion every single operative day. But we are missing it because in my, our mind, we look at the patient, what's the EMG, where is the MRI? I honestly, sorry, I don't look at this because many times the EMG, I'm not convinced about it. I go in and but the exam is correct. So if you learn how to do a good exam, honestly, you don't need an EMG or anything. You need to know how to do a good exam and then you'll figure it out instead of waiting the patient coming with a paper. Oh yes, yeah, I need to do pectoralis major transfer on. So this is, this is in summary and hopefully over the next years, this is gonna be much better understood. I, I really appreciate this, and it, it's a, a surprise for me to, to add this cause, the pectoralis minor dysfunction. Uh, I got a great experience of a fellowship with uh, Prof. Simon Frosick in Liverpool, and all I know about scapular dyskinesia is serratus anterior uh, injury, yep. trapezius injury, really. I didn't have any, I uh, didn't um, come across uh, pectoralis minor. So it's, it's, it's a very I'm glad. good thing. I'm glad to hear that. Like, keep, keep it in your dictionary about the scapular problem. Thanks so much, Professor Hassan, for such a nice talk and discussion. And I think we can come to end of uh, the first uh, lecture. Uh, Thank you. Professor Asha, would you like to present our uh, dear Professor uh, Hatim Galizaki? Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Bassem Al-Hassan.